At the end of March, a train leaves Zurich, carrying a man toward his destiny. On board, Lenin. He is firmly opposed to war, this imperialist war that was massacring the proletariat of the entire world with its machine guns. His forced exile has fed his doctrine, forged his patience, and hardened his determination. The hour has finally come for him to enter the arena. The famous Lenin arrived last night in Petrograd. He's the reddest of the reds. Lenin wants peace, without delay, and under any conditions. This is the idea he has come to defend in Russia. The very next day, Lenin presents his program to the Soviet. Although his prestige is great, his party, the Bolshevik party, is in a minority. It has barely 5,000 militants in Petrograd for two million inhabitants. Before the assembly, his slogans strike a blow. Down with the war. Because it's a capitalist war. Down with the provisional government. It is a bourgeois government. All power to the Soviets. Therefore to the people. The audience is stunned, including his own followers. I'm afraid that Illich is giving the impression he's gone mad, confides a Bolshevik delegate. And another says, His ideas seem totally unrealistic to all of us. Lenin is alone. And for good reason, his program, too radical, frightens people. The members of the Soviet want first to implement the democratic project they and the liberals have committed themselves to. And of course, the war has to continue, but not under any conditions. The Soviet wants to force the government to renegotiate the treaties drawn up between the Tsar and the Allies so that they respect the right of peoples to self-determination. The crisis is so violent that it results in the creation of a new government. An unprecedented cohabitation between socialists and liberals is created to lead Russia. Appointed Minister of War, the ambitious Alexander Kerensky continues his rise. And to reassure the Allies, he takes a risky gamble. Faced with a doubtful general staff, he decides to launch a major offensive against the Germans. On the 18th of June, the Russian army attacks. But the enthusiasm is short-lived. After two weeks, 400,000 men are dead, wounded, or taken prisoner. The Russian army is humiliated. The resounding defeat paralyzes the government. Helpless, the ministers undertake no reforms and merely deal with urgent matters. For the impatient population, this longed-for revolution is proving slow to keep its promises. In Petrograd, revolt is in the air. The most diverse convictions are expressed from one quarter to another. On Nevsky Prospect, the anarchists are exhorting people to loot the banks. Farther away, Ukrainian nationalists are demanding independence. In Vyborg, cradle of the February Revolution, 
The workers who have imposed an eight-hour working day now want to control hiring and firing. Meanwhile, at the Bolsheviks' headquarters, now transformed into a fortress, Lenin relentlessly harangues the crowds with conviction. They thought he was finished, but he is still combative. The bourgeois revolution is at an impasse. In these troubled days, Lenin moves his pawns forward. Lenin's thought and will were commensurate with the grandiose revolutionary possibilities of the country and the times. The others were a few centimeters short, or twice that, and often even more. After numerous incidents, Lenin manages to escape from the Allies, who dreaded they would see this notorious pacifist turn up in Russia. Almost as soon as he arrives, Trotsky chooses to rejoin the Bolshevik radicals. Trotsky, who could have been a formidable competitor to Lenin, becomes his brilliant second and an indispensable ally. Day after day, the ideas of this little party gain ground, as repeatedly proclaimed by their newspaper, Pravda. On the front, Bolshevik beliefs find an echo. Pravda has found a new way of obtaining the much desired peace. This is fraternization of Russian soldiers with German soldiers. Leaving the trenches to go over to the enemy trenches. Why continue fighting? Hasn't the war lasted long enough? Let's embrace. We're brothers. Let's drink our brandy together and talk about peace. This is the touching and shameful spectacle which the Bolsheviks are inviting us to see. To put a stop to this subversive movement, the government decides to act. But it is to make a mistake, a big one. At the beginning of July, the first machine gun regiment of Petrograd, who have been won over by Bolshevik ideas, are summoned to the front. Heroes of the February Revolution, they had, however, been given a guarantee not to be called into battle again. Disgusted, the regiment refuses to obey and threatens to overthrow the government. Petrograd is feeling the fevers of February. Thousands of armed men, joined by workers' committees, cross the city, ready to fight. After months of frustration, it is time for this revolution to go into action. One single word from Lenin, and the government would fall. Against all expectations, Lenin calls for moderation. In private, he says, If we were now capable of taking power, it would be naive to think we should be able to keep it. We must not rush things. Time is on our side. Confused, demonstrators spread in disorder through the city center. On Nevi Prospect, gunfire from the rooftops fired by troops loyal to the government provokes panic. The government recovers and begins looking for the troublemakers. Hundreds of Bolshevik militants are arrested. The party has lost its leaders. Trotsky is imprisoned in the Peter and Paul Fortress. Accused of high treason and pursued, Lenin disguises himself and manages to escape to Finland. Three months after his return to Russia, he is in exile once again. The chaos propels Kerensky to the head of a new government. He still enjoys huge popularity.
But the socialist Kerensky will now have to deal with the demands of the liberals. Order must be re-established at all costs. To meet these demands, he instigates authoritarian measures. Restoration of the death penalty for deserters, limitation of the rights of soldiers' committees. But to no avail. The government is unable to enforce them. On the front, between July and October, more than two million starving and battle-worn soldiers desert. The men wanted peace, land, and freedom. It was a miracle that there were still several million soldiers left in the army. But if Russian soldiers are leaving the front in droves, it is also because an insistent rumor is spreading. The distribution of land is about to begin. From the four corners of the empire, the peasants who had enlisted in the army did not want to arrive back in their village too late to get their share. And yet, the promised agrarian reform is still not in sight. So the villagers decide to implement it themselves, in their own way. Here, they requisition the livestock. There, they refuse to hand over the harvest. Plundering of the great estates multiplies. The revolution is turning into anarchy. Far from Petrograd, reaction is brewing in Moscow. The business community, the industrialists, the great landowners, and the Union of Officers. All of them consider that the revolution has gone too far. It is time to end it. At the end of August, it is a military figure who takes charge, a general with an iron fist, Lav Rakonilov, a disciplinarian who masters his troops. He has had deserters shot and has abolished soldiers' committees. He, too, wants order to return, in order, as he says, to save Russia. The specter of a military dictatorship is emerging. Addressing the danger, Kerensky dismisses the general from his duties. Kornilov's repost is immediate. He sends his Cossacks to attack the capital. The counter-revolution is no longer a phantom. It has become a reality, wrote Maxim Gorky. To retain control, Kerensky mobilizes all the partisans of the revolution, including his former rivals, the Bolsheviks. Liberated from prison, they activate their clandestine networks. Railroad workers divert military trains, and dismantle rails. Switchboard operators block communications. The troops in Petrograd take up their positions to defend the city. But the confrontation never takes place. Kordilov's troops refuse to fight their brothers in arms and eventually lay down their weapons. In a few days, the movement has been reduced to nothing. The counter-revolution has had its day. By the late summer of 1917, Russia is gradually sinking. The economy is practically at a standstill. 
what now remains of the hopes of February. Discouragement is everywhere. The greater the hopes had been of freedom, the deeper is the disappointment of seeing that the country is, at present, incapable of governing itself. Eight months of revolution have left Russia overwhelmed. Among the population, despair has reached its height. And another revolution is in the making. In early October, though still wanted by the police, Lenin returned secretly to Petrograd. Until then, he had been playing against the clock, but the time has now come to act. A few weeks previously, Leon Trotsky had been made president of the Soviet of Petrograd. For his part, Kerensky is trying to revive the democratic process. A council is created to prepare for the elections. True to the spirit of February, all factions are represented. But at the first meeting, Trotsky, at the head of the Bolshevik delegation, refuses to take part in the debates and walks out of the assembly. Trotsky has broken with the other socialist factions. One can feel and one knows that Lenin is behind him. Doesn't everyone know that Lenin, the god Lenin, has returned to Petrograd, where he is hardly bothering to hide? What has he to fear from Kerensky? Lenin and Trotsky have understood the worthlessness of their opponents the uselessness of conferences, of pre-parliaments, of the endless chatter in the halls where the new democracy meets. They have left the assemblies to their deliberations, slamming the doors behind them. To the soldiers worn out by war, the Bolsheviks propose peace. To the starving peasants, they promise land. And to the proletariat, they offer workers control of industry promises that would henceforth respond to the aspirations of the masses. But they still have to find a way to seize power. In the utmost secrecy, Lenin brings together the leadership of the Bolshevik party. He convinces a majority to launch an armed insurrection. But time is short. The Congress of all the Soviets of Russia is due to be held at the end of October in Petrograd. And Lenin doesn't want to include other socialist factions in governing the destiny of the country. It would be naive to wait until the Bolsheviks have a formal majority. No revolution ever waits for that. History will not forgive us if we do not take power now, he said. In mid-October, in spite of the freezing northerly wind, Nevsky Prospect is teeming with people. Among the bustling crowd, no one pays any attention to the little groups of workers, of soldiers, of sailors. Secretly, they have been carrying out reconnaissance missions for several days. Nobody suspects they are rehearsing a very carefully worked out scenario. Revolution is a tactical business. All you need is a small assault unit and some technicians. It is no longer a matter of provoking a popular insurrection, but of conducting a military operation. Trotsky has conceived a plan which relies on speed of execution to occupy strategic locations in the capital, and thus to seize power in all of Russia. On October
October 24, 1917, operations begin. Each group knows its objective. At the agreed time, they launch the attack. Postal, telephone, and telegraphic centers, banks, rail, and power stations. One after another, the targets fall under their control. No one in Petrograd realizes what's at stake. Not even Claude Henné. 11 p.m. Silence reigns over the city. No one can imagine what the silence of Petrograd is like. It's sepulchral, palpable, alarming, and in the end, it overwhelms you. Trotsky's plan is carried out with the utmost secrecy and with no violence. The capital is in the hands of the Bolsheviks. Kerensky has lost the game. The next day, disguised as a Serbian officer, he manages to get out of the capital in a diplomatic car. On the other side of the city, the Congress of the Soviets of Russia opens its first session. The majority of delegates, socialists, revolutionaries, Mensheviks, or labor alike, condemn the overthrow. They immediately leave the room. Before he leaves, a former comrade of Lenin shouts, One day you will understand the crime to which you have been party. Trotsky replies, You're all losers, washed up, pitiful. Your role is over. Go back to where you belong, in the dustbins of history. The remaining members of Congress then validate the creation of a new government the Council of People's Commissars. At its head, Lenin. Starting the worldwide revolution in Russia was as easy as picking up a feather. The great day, I was there. And of all the surprises of the revolution, it showed me the most surprising. Here is what I saw. On the corner of the Moika, a group of soldiers passed by me. They were marching in perfect order, like they used to in the old regime. Totally calm, not one gunshot was heard. I was arrested by soldiers and sailors. These are Trotsky's military revolutionary committee troops. They are masters of the whole city, and they're imposing an order on it that we haven't seen since the beginning of the revolution, and which takes us back to the times of the Tsar's autocracy. Staying in Petrograd seems risky to me. Freedom being the most precious thing to own, I'm leaving. In October 1917, the minority that took power still represents the aspirations of the Russian people. In Petrograd, a new world is being shaped. All over the world, it excites the proletariat. Everyone dreams of breaking their chains. It engenders a giant, determined to spread the flame of revolution to all countries. In the East, great light is rising to illuminate the hope of all peoples. It will also burn them in the flames of its passion.